So not all the announcements were made. If you're a leader, there's a 10.30 Saturday morning, there's a leaders meeting. And Pastor Freddie wanted me to put in the bulletin the prophecy that Pastor Albert gave last week. So if you want to read that, that's, that's important, the prophecy for the church. When I was typing it all out, there's a lot of, a lot of information there to think about. If you'd be so good as to turn to Romans chapter 11, verse 29. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you've given your word, Lord, glory to God, have it in you. Lord, we hope the message that is preached today is not just something that can be forgotten, but enter our heart and our mind and our soul, Lord, to, to be partaken of for all eternity, Lord, glory to God. Lord, comfort us and guide us now. Bless us with your word. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 11, if you'd be so good if you're doing the slides to use the KJV, it's important for this teaching to have accuracy of translation. Romans chapter 11 verse 29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. The context of this statement is in a chapter where Paul is talking about the failure of the children of Israel to appropriate their, their call with God. And then he used this illustration of an olive tree, which represents the law. And then he talked about branches being broken off, which were the people of Israel. Then he talks about the branches being, the natural branches being grafted back in, and wild olive being grafted in, which he was likening unto the Gentiles. So although the context of this was for the call of Israel, it actually shows something a lot deeper than that. It shows the nature of God himself. For when God has a gift, or God has his calling, he doesn't repent of this thing. He, he doesn't change his mind. So this text reveals that God has gifts for people, God has a call for his people, and God never rejects the fact that he has given any person a gift or the call. And the reason for this is both his gift and his call are perfect. It's people that fail to appropriate them that's the problem. Particularly note here that the gifts are plural and the call is singular. If you Google this or if you go on your favourite search engine and you put gifts and callings, this comes up and, and some people put gifts and callings. But that, that actually doesn't fulfil what the text is trying to get at. It's gifts and callings, singular. And some people feel that it's, a, look, it's only a letter, we can just add it. But just always remember that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, it says, For very I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot nor tittle shall not in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So the equivalent in English, a jot and a tittle are the two smallest little aspects of Hebrew writing. So every little aspect of the Hebrew writing, Jesus has said, is important. In our case here, we'd call it like dotting the I and crossing the T. So if you leave a dot off an I or you fail to cross a T, you haven't completed the, the, the letter that has been written. So that whether there's an S there or not an S there can actually be crucial to the whole meaning of what the text is getting at. So note, called gifts, one call. Several gifts, one call. In Ephesians 4, 4, it says, For there is one body and one spirit, even as there is one hope of your calling. If there was more callings, there wouldn't be more than one hope. So that just confirms the fact that the Bible is talking about one call, one hope of our eternal salvation. The Bible exhorts us to both read and meditate upon the Word. And so if you think about these texts, what, what do they mean to you? So if you, what are the gifts? What is his call? What is the link between the gifts and the call? So firstly, we'll start with the second part first. So the calling, just remember that God doesn't repent. He never regrets giving you a gift or a call. So that's just the nature of God. He doesn't re regret anything he does for us. What is God's call? What is the meaning of calling? What Or what is calling? What, what is this about? The Greek word here is klesis, meaning an intervention or figuratively a call or a vocation. In the Oxford Dictionary it has occupation, profession, trade, persons following a particular occupation. So a calling 
is is a thing that's got it's called you to do. It's it's like a profession. It's like a vocation. It's like something that you feel in your heart you're drawn to do. So, so this is the calling of God. In First Timothy six verse twelve, it says, "Fight the good fight, lay hold on eternal life, where unto you are also called, and has professed a good profession before many witnesses." So here we have one of the aspects of the call is that we are called to eternal life. And the other thing that's interesting is that is that in this call he was professing this was this was his profession. So so he was fulfilling the two aspects of this call. The call is the profession, is the thing that, that you are required to do. Hebrews chapter three and verse one says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly coin, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession or our calling, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the high priest of our profession or the high priest of our calling. So we have a calling and God is calling us into this thing. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So here, here the calling and vocation are put together in the text to make it clear as to what a calling is. So it's a profession, it's a vocation, it's a calling. Some people feel like they want to be a carpenter, that's their calling in this world. Or some people feel they want to be an engineer, that's, that's their calling. Or, or some people want to be a mother craft nurse or a doctor or a lawyer. That, that's an actual calling, that's a, a, a vocation to which you feel the gifts that you've got in you will be best suited to perform in, in the secular world. Well, in the same sense, God is calling us to, to things for his vocation, for his profession. And as we go on, we'll see what what aspect what there are aspects of this particular call. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are called to be saints. A saint is not like some denominational church is set up and you've got to go through all these things to be beatified as a saint. A saint is actually a separated or called out person. The, it's interesting that Jews understood this separation but they, they misunderstood what it had to be and, and they refused to have proper dealings with people and call people Gentiles and they didn't want to get made unholy by dealing with people that weren't, weren't of, their, of their culture or their race. But we are called to separate ourselves from sin and not separate ourselves from people. We are to be in this world but not of this world. So we are to be a holy people but we are not to be separated like the Jews who went up under law and refused to deal with people altogether and, and missed, missed their calling completely by being this way. Even us Romans chapter 9 verse 24, even us whom he has called, not of the Jews only but also of the Gentiles. So if you've got any doubt whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, God can call you. Once, once God, once the call was to the people of Israel but now the call is to anybody that God wishes to call. God is faithful, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So part of this call is called into the fellowship of his Son. And again in Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 it says, For brethren, you have been called into liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love. But, but by love serve one another. We have been called unto liberty. What this means is we're no longer under the burden and curse of the law to try and obey the letter of, of the law, the, the Ten Commandments and the 614 other ordinances that came with the law that set out in Exodus and Deuteronomy. And this was a burden for people. They couldn't, they couldn't abide. In actual fact, the law was perfect, but it showed that we were imperfect and unable to keep it. So now we get the gift of the Holy Ghost that calls us to liberty from this law but we don't, we don't get this liberty as an occasion of the, for, for the flesh, it says here, but by love, serving one another. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, it says that the eyes of your understanding being, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of the inheritance of the saints. 
So he wants us to know what the hope of our calling is, the riches of the inheritance with the saints. So here, with his calling, is now the Bible is opening up also an inheritance. And we know that John is, that we know this because Jesus in John chapter 14 verse 2 said, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, for I am where I am, that you may be also. So Jesus was preparing a place for us. So he made it clear that I'm going that you may inherit that this is part of the call so that you come and inherit this with me. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 7, it says, For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but, uh, but unto holiness. And sometimes it's interesting, if you want to try and describe what something is, it's quite often good to describe what something isn't. So we are not called to uncleanness, but unto holiness. If you don't understand what uncleanness is, read chapter Leviticus chapter 18 to understand what uncleanness is. So God has not called us to these things. God has called us to holiness. Hallelujah. That, that's the, one of the aspects of being a saint, is to be a holy person. Amen. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, if you could put that up on, on the screen. 1 Timothy, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that, that, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. This was the call that God gave the children of Israel. He wanted them to be a nation of kings and priests. So now they forsook that call. They didn't, they didn't partake of this will that God had for them. But now it has been transferred to the church so that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a and the holy nation, a peculiar or separated people, which also matches up with saints, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. So God does not want us to be in darkness. He has given this word to enlighten us so that we can understand what, what he has done for us. He's brought us out of darkness into his mar marvellous light. Chapter 3, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil, nor railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that whereunto you are called, that you should inherit a blessing. So God has called us to inherit a blessing. So when somebody writes a will and that person dies, then you inherit. So in, in many ways Jesus did that. He, he came and he died so that we could inherit the blessing. So it was because we've got a new covenant with that we're able to inherit. So Jesus died so that we could inherit this. So this is part of our call in chapter 5, verse 10 of 1 Peter. But the God of all grace, who has called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye suffer a while, note that, after that ye suffer a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen you, settle you. The servant is not greater than the master. They crucified Jesus Christ. Walking in this world, Peter said, it, they think it's strange that you not walk with him. Holiness and separated life makes you strange. The Jews, in a sense, have gone too far with it, but, but we don't we don't need to carouse or booze or copy the people of this world. We are a separate, separate, holy people. So that, that while we walk in this world, we will suffer a while. But in the end, make you perfect, strengthen, strengthen, establish and settle you. So that it's not a primrose path down which we walk after we get salvation. It's, it's difficult. And there are many, many things that hurt us. But God brings us out of them all. And that's the whole point of scripture. You see all these people that were down and out and God raised them up. And that's what all these things are written for. To encourage us when things are going wrong. Then, then we know that God will, will deliver us out of them all. And then there's the next, next aspect of the call. There is the call to the ministry. So, so he's called us to life. He's called us to be holy. He's called us to be saints. These are, these are the primary, primary aspects of the calling. And then the next step of the calling, which is part of that calling, is the call to the ministry. And we, we know quite well when Jesus called out his disciples. I don't want to go into this in particular. 
But Jesus calls people into the ministry and he, he chose these 12. Then if we go into 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. Let any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as, do it as of the ability that God gives, that God in all things might be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So if any man is in the ministry, let him minister in the gift that God gives him. Don't be a copycat. Don't try and be somebody else. God has given you a gift to, in which to minister. And you have a gift and a calling. Work in that gift and calling. And there's too many copycats of Benny Hinn and T.G. Jakes. They're, that's their call. That's their ministry. You be your person. You've got your call. You've got your ministry. And if you copycat, it's not going to do you any good anyway. It's quite clear that, that let him do it as the ability which God gives. So God gives you the ability as a minister in some aspect of the ministry. In Philippians 3 verse 14, it says, Paul said, I press towards the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So, so there's the calling, but as you get deeper and deeper into this call, you find there's a prize, there's a, there's a high part of this calling. And Paul, with, with his abundance of revelations, and give, began to see how deep this calling was becoming. He called it the prize of the high calling. So, so this is the aspects of the call. It's a vast subject. I, I cannot really fully give it the, the credence it needs in, in a message with these three aspects from this one verse, but at least you get an idea. We've been called to be a separated, holy people, brought into marvellous life. This is the calling of God. Hallelujah. So let's now consider the gifts. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So, so the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. So God gives gifts unto men. And again, here it's quite clear. And again, chapter, in James chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the, from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So, so if we deal with this, and if you see here, I don't know. So if you see that, if you, this hardly moves, but you can see the shadow moving a lot more than my Bible. And so therefore what it's talking about here is that is even God doesn't move in any way such that even you can see the, the slightest movement in the shadow of the thing which has been cast by the light passing over it. So God doesn't change even in the slightest little bit, so with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 4 says, God also bearing their witness both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So this is something that God also wants to do is make sure that we have gifts. Again in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 7 it says, so that you become behind you no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so Paul was, was wanting the Corinthian church to make sure that they had all the gifts that God wanted to give them. So the New Testament sets out the following gifts. There is the first gift, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, 38 and 10, 4. So, so that when we repent and are baptised in Jesus' name, we get the promise of the Holy Ghost is to come. This is the gift of the Holy Ghost, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is the first gift, the primary gift for the church is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then there are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. So once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, God can also give you another nine gifts. If we could go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8. And if you're new to the church, you should be aware that there is nine gifts and nine fruit, and they, they complement each other. There's some good teaching on that, but we haven't got time to go into this today. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 says, For unto one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Gifts of healing, gifts plural, healing singular. I'll go into that a little bit later. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, 
to another the interpretation of tongues. So some people have broken this down and put it in a slightly different order. There are nine gifts, of, there are three mind gifts, there are three power gifts, and three voice gifts. So the, the mind gifts are regarded as a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. The power gifts are deemed as faith, gifts of healing and working of miracles, and the voice gifts are prophecy, various ty types of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. There's also two other gifts cited in scripture. There's also the gift of grace, Romans 5, 12, 15, and the gift of eternal life, which is in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. So these are things that God gives us. And there's some quite interesting things that preachers have said about gifts. One preacher said, you don't qualify for God's gifts. Your gift qualifies you. You don't qualify for God's gift. Your gift qualifies you. There are no strings attached, another preacher said. Your gift is to express, express God, not impress him. Some people try to use the gift to impress God. It's God's gift, it's not going to impress God. God has given you the gift to express him. Although God, God does not repent that he's given anyone a gift, however, as you reap what you will sow, you will be rewarded for utilising your gift properly or punished for utilising it wrongly. So that just because God gifts are without repentance, doesn't, like everything else, there's, there's the example of, of a father. His father, he's, he's got a son, and his son turns 18 and he buys him this really powerful motor car. And, and the son goes off and kills himself because he drove too fast. It wasn't the car's fault. The car was fine. The gift was fine. But it, it was just that the fact that the son didn't utilise that gift properly. So you can be given the gift, the gift's fine, but it's the way you utilise it will end up how, how you will end up when you, after you have it. So that so if you've been given a gift, understand the gift and make sure you use it appropriately. Jesus taught this very clearly in the parable of the talents and the parable of the pounds and the parable of the talents. It, it says that this man had three servants and he gave everyone according to their ability. And to one he gave five talents, to the one he gave two, and the other one he went a long journey. The first one that had five traded and he got another five. The one that had two traded those two and got another two. Those that had one buried in the ground. And, and, and when the master came back, he said, well, why didn't you get interest on it? Why did you... So that, so that he was given a gift, but he didn't appropriate it. And again, with the, the par parable of the pounds, he got ten people and each gave them a pound. Seven of them didn't do anything. One buried it. One made five pounds and the other one made ten pounds. So that they were all given a gift, but each one of them did something different with that gift they were given. And they were judged accordingly as to what came from that gift they were given. So when you've got a gift, make sure you put it to the traders and make sure that it gets interest in, in, in parables. God's gift are free, but the rewards are earned. God's gifts are free, but the rewards are earned. And just a few little things that some preachers have, have had to say about, about God's gifts. 1 Corinthians 7, 7 it says, For I would... All men that be as I am myself, but every man has his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. And so Paul sort of says, this is a, I'd like everybody to live their life my way, the way I'm living it, but, but he said, that's not fair for other people I don't want to live it this way. So that he's made it quite clear that everybody has their proper gift of God. In 1 Peter 14 it says, As every man receives the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So, so we're here to minister these gifts one to another. In Proverbs 18, 16, it says, A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. Note, the gift makes room for you, don't make room for the gift. I don't know if I need to elaborate on that, but some people, when they've got the gift, try and push the gift. It's like somebody that's got this fantastic singing voice and they go for an audition and they say, I'm the best singer in the world, I'm the best singer in the world. Let me hear you sing. Oh, no, no, no. See, nothing's going to happen because they want to hear the gift. And talking about it and trying to push the gift without demonstrating the gift's not going to get you anywhere. So, so your gift will make room for you, don't make room for your gift. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, it says, But covet earnestly the best gifts, yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And it's interesting, 
The Tenth Commandment says don't cover anything of your neighbours. Don't cover their ox, their ass, their servant, their man servant. This is, don't cover anything that is your neighbours. But it's actually interesting that we are allowed to covet the gifts of God. And actually, in fact, it goes one step further. It says cover earnestly the, 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 the best gifts. Cover earnestly. So rather than worrying about buying this super beautiful house and um, all this, this flash luxury car and, and coveting this thing or that thing, wouldn't it be best to channel our, our, our abilities to covet into coveting the best gifts of God, which are eternal, rather than, the, than the, the, the carnal things of this world that are temporal? Today's luxury car is tomorrow's scrap metal. So, so don't think these things are going to give you any pleasure or any joy. But these things that, that we are to cover earnestly are eternal. In Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 10 it says, Receive my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choice gold. So here the Proverbs is putting knowledge above choice silver and gold. And in 8.11 it goes on to say, For wisdom is better than rubies, and all things that can be desired are not to be compared to it. Wisdom is more valuable than anything you can compare to it, the scripture saying. And wisdom is one of the gifts, the word of wisdom is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We are to earnestly covet the best gifts. And as one preacher said, the best gift is the gift that God gives you, whether prophecy or this or this. Um, every best gift is the gift that's required at that time. So no one gift is actually better than any other gift. They're all best, but they're best for that situation. Even so you, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12, even so you, for as much as you are zealous in spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. So that, so that we, we get all these things for a purpose, to edify the church. There's a purpose for the gifts, to edify the church. Gifts are linked to the calling because they are the driving force within God's call. So now we're going to link the gift and, and, and the call. In Acts chapter 2, verse 39, it says, For the promise, that is, of the Holy Ghost, is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So the gift of the Holy Ghost that God is giving out is given to those people to whom he is calling. So, so firstly, that... That, that we understand this gift is, is linked to the call. The gift is given to those whom he is calling. In 2 Thessalonians 1.11 it says, Wherefore, also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfil all good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. So here we're mixing the work of faith with power with the calling. Here it is clear that the work of faith and with power is the engine room of the call. So work of faith with power is the engine room of the call. So, so that God is giving the gifts to drive the call. So you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That, that's, the, that's the evidence that's driving the gift, driving the thing that was given to that person that was called. Romans chapter 12 and verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us where the prophecy... Well, let's turn to that. Can we go to Romans chapter... 12 verse 6. Romans chapter 12. So we're linking now the gift and the call. The gifts and the call. Romans chapter 6, 12 verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, the gift, let us prophesy unto the proportion of our faith, gift, or ministry, call, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches, call on teaching, or he that exhorts, call on exhortation, or he that gives, call, let him do it with simplicity, or he that rules, call with diligence, he that showeth mercy, call with cheerfulness, fruit. So, so here we have all these aspects of the ministry being linked up, so we've, we're mingling now the call and the gifts together, and, and naturally God, for good measure, throws in a few fruit. Just, just to make the whole fruit so it work properly. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, 11, it says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So the positions are given 
The calls are to the people. The positions are given to the church, but the call is for the person. You get that? So God gave to the church some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So they're given. These ministries are given to the church, but people are called into them. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28 it says, God has said in the church, let's turn to that, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 28. And God has said in the church, first apostles are called, secondarily prophets are called, thirdly teachers are called, after that miracles, a gift, then gifts of healings, plural, now it's just just on that, it's interesting, there's gift of heal, gifts of healing, as in the gifts of the Holy Ghost in 1 Corinthians 12, 9. And here, the gifts of the church is gifts of healings to the church. So the church is given gifts of healings. Individuals are given gifts of healing. That's something for you to study. Helps is a call. And I always have to say, a lot of people look at the that the pulpit ministry is the primary area of the church. But here we have a call which is called helps. I know I always feel without helps the church becomes helpless. Think about that. Governments are a call. Diversities of tongues, a gift. So, so here we have in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, this, this mingling of a gift and a call, which, which the call is the thing that brought, brings us to eternity, and the gifts of the powerhouse which, which enables it to get there. If we could now go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. 2 chapter Peter chapter 1, verse 3. According to his divine power, hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So we are given all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to his glory and virtue. If you don't understand what virtue is, it is moral excellence. So God has called us to glory and moral excellence. That is his call. He wants us to be saints. He wants us to be pure. He wants us to be a holy people. We are called to glory and virtue or moral excellence. Just skip down to verse 5. And besides this, that's for by, whereby unto given unto you exceeding grace and precious promises is, is what the way it starts. So beside this, that is the exceeding great and precious promises, give all diligence, which is an aspect of wisdom, add to your faith, which is a gift, a fruit and a portion, virtue, which is moral excellence, and to virtue, knowledge, which is a gift, and to knowledge, temperance, which is a fruit, and to temperance, patience, which also is a fruit, and to patience, godliness, which is also a fruit. And God means to brotherly kindness, which is the primary law, that we should love one another, and brotherly kindness to charity, or the love of God, or agape. So that, so that the thing that, that, that fully allows all this to mold together, the, 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 the mortar between the bricks, of course, is love. So you can have all these things, but without love linking them all together, they, they become as a sounding brass and tinkling, tinkling symbol, as Paul said. So here we have salvation is not certain, but you can make it certain. And if we look at 2 Peter verse 1 and chapter 10, it says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence, which is an aspect of wisdom. And diligence is something that you have to work hard to do. Diligence is something which is striving for perfection, to make your calling and election sure. So we give diligence to make our calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. So here, here are a number of things that he talks about here, about, about virtue and knowledge and temperance and godliness and brotherly kindness and love one for another. So if you do these things, you shall never fall. So these are the things that God has set down to make our calling and election sure. Amen. Bless the Lord. So let us, let us ever be mindful of, of the thing that God has called us to do. He's called us into his marvellous light. He's called us to be holy. He's called us to be saints. And then he's given us all these gifts to drive this call. So in the end, we can, we can hear from him, well done, you good and faithful servant. Enter the joy of the Lord. Amen. Bless the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Lord, 
Let these words sink down into our hearts and soul, Lord, that we may understand, Lord, the depth and the reach and the power, powerfulness of your word. Lord, comfort us and guide us, Lord. Lord, that we, that we are the people that you call us to be. Lord, that we are the nation of kings and priests that you desire us to be. A holy nation, set aside, Lord, showing the thing and speaking the word in due season. Comfort us and guide us now in these things. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.